Chaos to Cured podcast is here to explain our perspective of the human experience. We hope it leads to questions, learning, wisdom, and knowledge. Welcome to Chaos to Cured. Uh, you have Jeffrey Freed, author of Right Brain Children in a Left Brain World. That was a New York Times bestseller, a phenomenal book. Highly suggest it. You can reach out to him if you have um, children or you yourself are dealing with um, his specialty is autism uh, right now, dyslexia, um, and of course, ADHD. Um, he's world renowned on all, all three. Um, I would highly suggest it. But of course, just if you're dealing with you know, hypersensitivity issues or you have a non-neurotypical mind or uh, children or a sibling, you know, reach out. Uh, so really quickly, you know, one of the things that um, we kind of talked about, you know, bringing up and uh, it, for me, it's been a life-saving tool is, you know, how we can retrain our brain, uh, rethink, um, you know, it's called neuroplasticity. So the, the name sounds really fancy, um, but I can give a good analogy that's visual for me. Um, if you think of like a cart and buggy or a horse, you know, drawn carriage going through like a muddy road. So what happens, so for everyone listening, this is what neuroplasticity is. So you have this road that you're building each day, you go down the same way. So if you get angry, every morning because your coffee is burnt or because you know something didn't go right if that's your first reaction you're building this trench so what we can do is by being aware of our minds being aware of our habits or whatever issues we're struggling with we can change how we react to a perceived threat uh, an aggression whatever it might be and we can retrain our brain to choose a different way it it's hard at the beginning so back to the horse drawn carriage you have those deep ruts when you start taking a different route it takes a while because you have to kind of do it with consistency um so neuroplasticity is an amazing tool where you know it helps people um like me with ocd get over certain patterns um, there, there's a, a whole bunch of different uses, so I, w I won't get into it right now. Um, Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on, first of all, what we're learning, what we're seeing? Um, it's a, an amazing topic. So just jump in. We'll have a good time with it. Okay. Um, my feeling, my take is that, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, people used to think we're hardwired. We have IQs that everyone had uh, had when I was a teacher, classroom teacher. I knew everybody's IQ. They had a 114 or an 88 or 122. And that was how you, and, and it had a real strong impact as a teacher on how you perceived that person. And um, it was really stupid because IQ tests, for example, and I'm, this isn't the main topic, but IQ tests are simply, a, you know, like ratio of correct answers to incorrect answers. And if the person is nervous or the person has test anxiety, or if the person is sick that day, or the person is distracted by the attitude of the tester, they're going to- Uncooperative. Gonna, yeah, they're gonna, what's going to happen is they're going to score lower. So to think of that as a hardwired thing that will never change is deadly. Um, and it's destroyed a, quite a few people, I'm sure. Now we have a range. The way I look at neuroplasticity, I don't look at it quite as, as other people do. I don't think if you're born, um, you know, pretty left brain, pretty linear, that you have the real capacity to be a right hemisphere dominant artist, can visualize easier um, really well. but you can get better at it and you should. And if you're a right hemisphere dominant creative individual, you don't have to be um, impossibly incompetent at tasks that are linear or showing steps. You can retrain your brain within certain parameters. 
you have, you know, sort of a range, it would be the best word, a range of how your brain can act. So neuroplasticity to me, and you may disagree, neuroplasticity to me means that, yeah, you have a lot of wiggle room. And if you have a, a measured IQ of 103 or 105, it doesn't really mean anything. On a better day, you might score 120 or 130. Or if with a better tester, you might score 140 or 150. So the way I look at it is if your IQ is anywhere near 100, you could easily be brilliant, um, especially the way these tests are timed and biased towards linear intelligence. But you have a lot of wiggle room, and you definitely should add to your game. That's how I teach students. Most of my students aren't linear sequential, obviously. Most of my students are right brain, non-neurotypical, hate showing steps, um, have trouble with anything sequential. And what I do to them, do to them, do for them, is to try to teach them, yeah, why, do, why am I doing algebra? Um, they might say to me, and I'll never be a mathematician. Well, my answer to that is, you might want to do alge algebra because it's attacking a weakness. And if you persist and you get good at it, you're adding to your game. And you won't lose any of your creativity. You'll just have a little sequentiality. And it'll make you a hard person to beat in anything. Um, and I would tell that to people who are linear, too. You know, for example, one quick exercise for anyone who's not good at visualizing is to take, you know, just, just look at a, at a flower pot. Like I'm looking at one now sitting on top of my mantle. And I'm looking at it. And then I'm getting a good image. And then I shut my eyes and I try to see it. And then I rotate it. I imagine it falling, turning on its side, landing, breaking, um, myself picking it up. And now I put it together and I put it back on the mantle. That kind of exercise done like for a minute or two daily will really help your visualization. In other words, if, it, if it's not your first mode of attack, it doesn't mean you can't do it because people have remarkable, remarkable abilities within those parameters to, to completely, not completely, it's a terrible word, to significantly change the way they process the world. And we all need to do that. It also helps you with understanding how the other half processes. It would be great. A sequential people to get a picture um, by practicing of what visual spatial can do. And they'd probably look at those people with more respect. Or if you're visual spatial and art, an artist and eschew people who are, you know, bean counters or accountants. Well, when you get a little, a little glimpse into how they process the world, um, you might be very impressed with them. And again, it just adds to your game and that's why you do it. Well, it's interesting because I think uh, when people talk about uh, neuroplasticity, um, so two things that I really want to address. One, absolutely, you know, being able to um, work on a weakness, ab always helpful. The first point that you had were there are some things that we we can't um, change. And there's there's always people that do kind of try to push that, uh, whether it's, you know, um, it, you can't beat someone up and make them not schizophrenic. You know, it's not something that's feasible. You can't. Um, there's not a magical uh, the cure. Okay. So when we talk about neuroplasticity and that was such an important point. So thank you, Jeffrey, for that. Um, there are some things that, you know, we cannot change what we can do and, and what, but, you know, at least for, for me, where it's been super helpful is whether you have anxiety, 
you know, whether, you know, for me, um, anger is something that I just can't afford myself to have. Um, what I started doing, and I, I have no idea if this is true. I know it's been true for me on the way down as I've become more stable over the years with bipolar, the swings between mania and depression were a struggle. And so my hypothesis was that if I could control it better and minimize those peaks and then both the peaks and valleys over time, I could at least stabilize. And I have found that that does work. Same thing with, um, I mean, I, I lose track of my thoughts all the time. I jump around on tangents. I cannot get rid of my ADHD. So it's very important for people to know the way my brain processes, what you were saying, like there's within parameters. You can't change, there's certain aspects. And I, I really do agree with that. The way I process the world is through patterns. And honestly, that's what makes me good at working with others because I see people as kind of a puzzle it's enjoyable for me to figure out what patterns they have. Interactions with other people, it's fun for me. I love managing a team. Uh, the more people that I have to figure out, the quicker, the better to make things run smoothly. That's enjoyable. Um, that can't be changed in terms of the way I kind of process and perceive. My reactions always can. And that's something that I really want to kind of hammer home with people listening because I know a lot of parents out there are sitting there going, okay, my kid is always panicking every morning all the time. Well, if you're panicking too, they're picking up on it. If you're ex expecting it, you have to change those expectations and it's going to take a process, but it's over time. You slowly start rewarding the, the, the correct behavior. Every time they calm down a little faster, you say, wow, you calm down. The recognition, um, it trains them to also start paying attention to them. And again, this leads us right back to the ability to retrain kind of how we, you know, there's certain parameters. And Jeffrey, that was such a phenomenal point. So do you get where I'm going with this one for like parents and, and even children? I know for me, no one except you, you were the only person that I worked with that had ever taken the time. And this is before, long before neuroplasticity was even a word, but you were having me, you know, try to pay attention to, you know, when I was losing my temper or when I was, why I was frustrated. You were trying to get me to see what those things were and then change that behavior on a consistent basis. So, you know, it was something you were teaching long before they even made it something they were really studying and it was very effective so when they when i started reading and researching on how impactful it can be especially for behavior um both of uh you know my myself and my sister had my mom known some of these tricks by kind of figuring out how i reacted and being able to stop before it went too far. Um, it allows everything to kind of flow a little smoother, brains work a little better. And the individual, myself, I would have figured things out. Like, let me give a for instance. Um, and then Jeffrey, I, I want to get your take on all of this. So um, when a lot of times I would be frustrated at something and I would be like, I, I, I would kind of get that pouty face and uh, I would express my frustration verbally. And because I was frustrated, one person was trying to fix it. Usually my mom was trying to listen. My dad would try to humor me or tickle me. Um, and again, for him, he just wanted to try to, he thought if he made me laugh or made me giggle, that would cheer me up. I was in a place where I didn't want to be cheered up and I needed space. So that inability to kind of communicate with my parents and stuff like that made things harder. Now, um, with time and with communi clear communication, understanding that's how things are reacting, both of the parents could take 
first of all, notice, okay, one, he's in this state. Then two, if you, if you, again, we're not, I'm not advocating coddling people, but if you know that your behavior might enhance a younger mind choosing a better option, then why not do it? You're, you're helping them learn and form their brain is how I look at it. And um, so let, 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 jump let into throw, it. Yeah, let me t- talk. Something that you said sparked my interest a lot. One of the things I teach kids, I teach this to kids as young as seven or eight, and certainly for teenagers and adults. Um, the way I, this is really an effective technique that's very specific and anyone can use it. That's why I'm, I'm going to talk about it. When you, I would say this to you when you are ready to explode, um, I would say to you, okay, you're about to lose it. Um, you might throw something, you might break something. Um, ask yourself this question, Kirk, is what I would have said to you. If you do explode, visualize the consequences, trace it through what's going to happen to you, what's going to probably happen. The pluses might be that you get it out. And then after an eruption, you usually feel better. But the minuses would be you'd feel shame because you'd hate yourself for doing it. You'd upset the family and it would ruin other people's as well as your day. Make a choice, Kirk, is what I would say. Pick one and then live with the results and don't whine and bitch about punishments or consequences because you've already visualized them. So if you're going to act like a barbarian, um, then you're going to have repercussions. There's pluses. The one I just told you about feels good to vent, but there's negatives. Make a choice. Think about it. Don't do anything until you visualize both scenarios. Make a choice and then live with the results and don't come complaining to me or anyone else. You have made the choice. That's incredibly effective because it utilizes one of the neurotypical strengths, which is visualization. Um, certainly, it's, it's drama, which a lot of these people like, and it puts you in control. You're making the choice. And people love that. You know, it's worked miracles with kids and, and teenagers. They simply make a choice. And it works cool for me. That. Yeah, it and it for works me. for every works for I mean, almost everybody. You you did that and and for me it 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 really my life started at least I started paying attention to some consequences. Um you know, once you know we had worked together for a few years and I was 14 or 15 by that time. And, you know, life did not get easier for me. It got way harder, but there were little things. Um, and, and that's one reason why we do this show too, is there's a lot of people um, that don't understand some of the stuff that we talk about, or they do understand it and they're kind of scared to talk about it. Um, and we need to do a show on that later on too, just, because there are a lot of people out there that feel scared to even talk about it. They're anxious to express, but they have a lot to say and it needs to be said. So if you're, if you are a guest and you really, or if you are somebody that's interested um, and you really want to share something and you're scared, reach out um, because we can always use a pseudonym or something um, and have you as a guest for something specific. We've just been talking about it. So side note, again, another tangent, something I struggle with, one of the things that um, I was going to just say uh, was by being able to take that time to think about uh, the repercussion, that momentary pause um, and vis- visualization, like you said, it takes away the excuses, which is great. Um, it also takes away the, the hottest moment or the hottest point at when we make the worst mistakes at this like peak or I, I, that's all I can really think of. It's an explosion of heat when we are super angry and we just lose touch of what's rational. We all do this. Any human does 
for me, those moments turn from, you know, something little into, you know, six squad cars showing up in my front yard. I mean, it was absurd. So it's, it's a different kind of level, but at the same time, um, one, every time I was able to choose correctly, if I had understood that, you know, one, celebrate that, make sure reward when you see a good, a good choice, because each time, you know what, it, it, I pointed this out the other day with um, both my nieces were, were over and, you know, we're sitting there playing with the dogs. And um, I don't, I don't remember why, but you know, when we train a dog, um, the best way to get results, you know, is to use treats or to pet them, to give them a reward. You click a button, you know, when they do it right and you pet them, you know, they ring the bell before they want to go out. You know, it's positive reward. And what we do with humans is, you know what, they, they get over it, they calm down. And what's a really common thing for families to do is say, you know what, um, now that you're calm, let's go over all the things you did wrong. Right. No, the problem is they already know. Okay. Most, most of the time children that mess up already know. I always knew when I screwed up, you don't have to point out the obvious rubbing salt in the wounds doesn't help. Um, but one thing that does always help and something that made me listen was when people were compassionate when people were kind when they would notice when i was trying hard those positive rewards made me stay on a path of trying it made me try to be better yes i continually failed and some of that was not my like completely my fault. I was chemically not able to control myself. So I had meltdowns that were massively public and not fun. Um, but over time, you can, you can train a, at least yourself to be a lot calmer. And we did our show on calm. Um, but like you said, training yourself to not react. Besides the time, you also gave me the breathing. So breathe in you know, for three seconds through my nose, hold it for a second and breathe out for six. That was always helpful. And by the way, you did that again, like, you know, 25 years ago or 20, or oh, longer than that. But that was, and they now have proof. Of course, you breathe in through the nose. It stimulates the prefrontal cortex. Um, it's, it's very effective. Breathing. And each time you, you see a child, a loved one, and yourself, how many times um, did I, I didn't ever have anybody that worked with me in the school that told me, listen, you know, they would put an, a, a sticker on or a plus sign or whatever. Or, and you know what? Teachers can only do so much. Um, but a lot of times it's really important for people to understand and be cognizant. So metacognition. Uh, being aware of why you're doing something. So when you do celebrate and you did something well, be aware of it. So when you stay calm, when you choose a compassionate way to respond, if you're out there and you're rage tweeting and you sit there and you take a step back, you go, okay, I'll send a nice response instead of yelling at somebody. These are random people. There's no reason to yell at somebody. Each time you do that, then you go, wait a second. You know what? That was the right move. And then, you know, reward yourself with having, you know, a sip of water that you enjoy, but just being aware you made a good choice. So you're doing something that's pleasant for me, that has really helped. And again, every time I make the right choice, it gets easier to make the right choice. Again, stay calm instead of choose explosion. And in the family dynamic, that was something that we really needed. Um, and you had helped so much with even just getting me to breathe and calm down and that pause. So a lot of times just getting people to kind of, you know, before you yell at somebody, before you react, just breathe. I think a lot of times 
um, you know, we've said this before on the show, we're tagline society, you know, people just react instantly before they get any substance. Right. We judge people instantly. I am uh, guilty of it. I try really hard not to, but we all are. Um, you know, so we can change a lot of things about our self besides like patience is one thing that's really great to work on staying calm. Um, you're visualizing and think of thinking of the consequences. What would be something else that you'd suggest for parents or for children or anybody, um, you know, that they can really think on and work on to help them in life? Because we've covered calm, we've covered, you know, of course, repercussions. That's a great one. Can you think of a couple other ones? Breathing is great. Yeah, I think. I don't know, my, my brain doesn't take me to where exactly you want me to go, but this, I do have an important point that is peripheral, but ex extremely integral to what we're saying. When people yell at, you know, if you, like, we'll take you, for example, when you had created a scene and you felt really shamed afterwards, they point up all the stuff you did wrong. They're doing that probably for one of two reasons, it's a way to express anger at you because they're pissed. The other thing is, is they think you're going to learn. If you tell them what they did wrong, they expect that you're going to be able to change it, work hard and change it. That's not what happens with most people, especially this highly sensitive population that we have so many people engulfed in at this point. Um, the highly sensitive person, the people that I work with and non neurotypicals almost all this way, they get um, they just get angry and entrenched and so, sort of sit there and become reactionary and do exactly the opposite because they perceive you as attacking them by pointing up their weaknesses. Gentleness and the thing you said that I really resonated with, was reward, I mean, I use this all the time, reward good behavior with praise, but not too much praise. Because if you give one of my neurotypical people, students, too much praise, they a lot of times perceive it as pressure. They immediately go to, oh my God, how am I ever going to do this again? If I don't, I'm going to feel so disappointed. Um, so you, essentially, you praise them, definitely reward um, and he, and you know, if it's a, if it's a, if it's me, and I break a pattern, I'm not going to have a glass of water. I'm going to have something really good. Now, me not being a drinker, I go to the vitamin cottage and get some really special concoction that I love, um, some kind of juice or a seltzer or something, and I, I really just enjoy it, savor it. Or, piece of food, like even a chocolate cake or something that I normally wouldn't eat. But you need to get that association with something pleasant and a reward so that when a person's about to explode, they'll think about what may happen if they don't explode and the rewards and how they felt. I mean, that's behavior therapy. That's stuff that B.F. Skinner talked about. Only we're using pleasure and not pain as a teaching mechanism. Again, one quick thing that I have to throw in here is the non-neurotypical person almost always has exaggerated senses. And you really need to, if you're working with your son or daughter or student, you really need to factor that in. Positivity, but not too much because they'll recognize it as um, either pressure or, um, you know, you're, you're being false. You're not telling them the truth too much, too much good, good, you know, smiling and reward isn't good either, but subtle stuff like that. If you persist, you will get where you want to go because they're, they're not just visual brains. The folks that I work with, they are associ associative brains and, if, for example, they associate not exploding with a, you know, some really good ice cream or a nice smile from their mom or dad, when they evaluate whether to lose it or not, that's just one more reason not to lose it. I, I absolutely um, found that 
some of those things are, are very helpful. The positive, the yelling is, is something that, you know, again, um, one of the toughest parts, um, and I know um, parents that, that are dealing with, you know, children that are, you know, um, high on the spectrum in, in terms of when I say high, in terms of their, they're more extreme. Um, and it, it can be a lot for the parents to deal oh, yeah. with. It can be a lot for what's really amazing is when the whole family starts, um, reacting differently. They, the whole dynamic can quickly change if the parents or siblings, if everyone gets involved in the same process of trying to act, okay, we're all going to work on trying to be calm. We're all going to try to listen to each other. We're all going to try to communicate openly, only when this, and then again, you do the same thing. You figure out a way to make it fun, to make it pleasurable. Um, and sometimes competitive is fun. I think one I did like what you said where too much praise does did feel like pressure to me. The key thing for me was genuine. If it was genuine praise, if you want your children, you want anyone to work amazingly beyond what you know even they know they're capable of doing, all you really have to do is be truthful, genuine, and give praise when it's due. It's, it's literally that simple when a child or when, um, uh, and as somebody that works for you, um, or works with you when they do something amazing and you say to them, you know what? Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm grateful for the time you put into it. And it, if it's genuine, people will move mountains for that. Children will just about anyone will. We don't use that much in this society. And that's why I really love neuroplasticity. So my idea and like, of course, my vision of, of a peaceful world would be all these people, every single person thinking before they acted, you know, trying to be compassionate before they judge. I, I really try hard. Um, none of us are really in our, at least for me, the world is kind of wired to put me against other people. I don't like that. Our whole system is built like that. You're not supposed to like this person because that aggression probably kicks up dopamine and serotonin and gets us back on the same platform. I don't know. Um, I know there are reasons why commercials are run the way they are, why platform, social platforms are run the way they are. So to me, I'm trying to make sure that I provide myself the right tools. And so um, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, wow, there's, there's nothing else I can do. I'm doing medication. I'm going to see a therapist. I look up neuroplasticity. Um, it's really interesting. It's a great concept. And the idea really is that you, you work with your therapist. Um, you work with a specialist, somebody that can give you tools. Um, and you utilize those tools consistently and with time your brain really can uh improve and like jeffrey said at the beginning we want to say of course there's a limit to what can be done but um you know in terms of a lot of different variables no need to rehash it but um jeffrey did you want to add something um this is a fun topic yeah. we could probably even do a second part on this yeah i have one thing i want to add that's extremely germane with the people I work with, and that's a lot of people. Um, the way I look at it with non-neurotypical people who are very highly sensitive people, we don't learn from mistakes. We learn from success. You're supposed to learn from your mistakes, but when you're highly sensitive and real hard on yourself, if you make a mistake, you are definitely going to beat yourself up you don't need anyone else beating you up. Nobody's more hard on you than you. And you will probably tend in the current, you know, the current situation, you would probably tend to just avoid that activity that caused you frustration, that you made a lot of mistakes in 
and really specialize and spend a lot of time on the stuff that you're good at. So I like that statement. We don't learn from mistakes. We learn from success. And one of my secrets in working with, with people is to whatever it is that they're struggling with, I need as a teacher to find a way. And I'll usually use their visualization strengths to circumvent that um, attitude of I'm never going to try this again and attack through. I mean, I make it easy for them. I'll show them a way to do a math problem or spelling, for example, how to visualize spelling and they get success. And when they get success, they're more willing to try it because they're not afraid if they're, if they're having trouble on a certain subject, they don't hate the subject or the teacher, which they oftentimes say they do. They hate the fact that they're failing at it or not being very smart at it was way, this is one of the ways they would say it. But if you can give them success and it can't be artificial and you have to know what you're doing, but I can do it. And a lot of the people I work with have learned how to do it. What you're ending up doing is you're, getting some success, you're not pushing it too far so that when you come back and want to teach it again, whatever it is, instead of having a dreaded, a dreaded attitude of just, I'm not going to try, or I'm just going to shut down, or they will have an association of, hey, this is safe. I can do math. I can spell. And you can do all that by utilizing people's visualization strengths. We're not going to cover that tonight. And we may, ne we may never cover that because it's pretty detailed, but it works. And that's pretty much my finish. That's all I've got to say on the subject for tonight. I, I love that. Um, the last part I, I did want to say for me, a lot of times um, that statement right there at the end um, is we need to do a whole show on that, but I wanted everybody to really hear that. Uh, for me, I was the same way. I did not really learn. I could keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. The moment, you know, sticking my hand on a burning stove. I mean, of course, some of those things, you know, yes, I, I was able to figure that out, but a lot of really stupid mistakes and I call them stupid because I kept doing them. Um, and I knew I would get I would get harmed, hurt, doing the same things over and over again. And all I really needed was that one person to say, um, "Oh wow, good job doing this," um, and or not doing this, or "Good job wearing your helmet." I'm really proud that you chose to wear your helmet instead of riding your bike without one. I would have had far less concussions, right? Huh. It wasn't that my parents didn't congratulate me or help me or love me. That's not the point. It's just that what you said, very important. Um, same thing with math. So people listening to this very, uh, for me, um, a lot, oftentimes if somebody started with the solution and worked backwards, it was less terrifying for me. It was easier for me to learn. It was already a success. There was no fear of failure. And a lot of the people that parents see and that teachers feel are not trying are often literally so terrified of failing terrified yep. of not being perfect that what ends up happening is they literally just shut down and one thing that has been useful for me and something jeffrey you did with me is when i was working on math or struggling with something you would go through and you know you'd help me with the pro the the problem what i do with my niece and with other individuals if they're struggling with specifically math i'll use it as a great example is i will actually go through and i will say what should i put here and i'll write it so there's no pressure even of them having to do it i'll do the first couple and you make it fun yeah. there's no fear of failure because i'm the one making the mistake you know and then what you do is after two or three they'll literally grab the pen from my hand why is that bro so, That's so I, I wanted to add that you you triggered it and you brought out something you I love that statement I just wanted to make sure we honored that because that was fa fabulous so 
Um, let's close it there. Jeffrey, thank you for uh, another wonderful show. Thank you to everyone who's listening. And, uh, you know, please let us know if there's something we can talk about or something that you're struggling with and you want us to talk about it. Um, we will release shortened versions of these um, with snippets as well um, in our off season. And we'll continue to record along the way too. So please reach out anytime. Thank you so much for listening. Like, follow, subscribe, all the good stuff um, and share with people that you think that it will help. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Gas to Geared Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with everyone you know. And definitely like, follow, and subscribe. Certainly leave a comment if you'd like. Let us know what you'd like us to talk about the next time. Also, in our show notes, there should be direct links where you can follow us on our social media as well as reach out to us directly. Thanks again and have a great day. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on Chaos to Cured podcast are the speaker's own. All discussion is based on our own experiences. We do not and cannot guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information. Chaos to Cured podcast cannot give medical or health advice. All discussion is based upon our personal experiences and meant for general and educational purposes. This podcast is not a substitute for professional help or for diagnostic purposes for yourself or another. Cast Cured Podcast always encourages you to consult an appropriate professional.